Now before we get into the details of how to or rather a demonstration of how to use the memory allocation functions, it is probably a good idea to understand how memory allocation works in the first place, right? or at least get a high, high level understanding of what is happening. The main thing that we are interested in is a function called malloc. Okay? Just like printf, malloc is another function that is provided to you as part of the C standard libraries. And what it does is that it allows you to allocate memory. Actually what malloc does is it allows you to request memory. Right? You can ask for a certain amount of memory to be allocated to you and the runtime which is whatever code corresponds to actually implementing the malloc function will interact with the operating system, ask for a certain amount of memory, reserve that for you and give you a pointer corresponding to that memory. What you need to specify is the size of the memory block that you need. So let us say you only want space for storing one integer, that is fine, you can ask for 4 bytes of memory. If you want to store a million integers, go ahead, go ahead and ask for 4 megabytes of memory. Right? So if you ask on the other hand for something like you know 40 terabytes of memory and your system does not have that kind of RAM, what will happen? the memory allocation will fail and the malloc function will essentially return a null pointer. Right? So when memory allocation fails, you get back a null pointer, meaning that the system was unable to allocate the memory that you requested. Right? And when that happens, if you then try to dereference a null pointer, right? a null pointer is essentially a pointer with the explicit value 0. By convention, what we say is when the value in a pointer is 0, you could think of it as pointing to you know the lowest memory address, but pretty much by convention the standard thing is to say that it is not possible to access the lowest possible memory address. right? Or that leads to a situation in the C language which is actually a undefined behavior or an invalid kind of code. Right? And what happens is that if we try to dereference a null pointer, it is not going to go and try to find out what is there at memory location 0. It will pretty much straight away tell you that there is a memory violation. Something went wrong, you tried to access memory you were not allowed to access and the program will crash. Okay. So what exactly does it mean to say that memory has been allocated to you? What is actually happening behind the scenes of course is you have requested a certain amount of memory. The C runtime took your request, it went and communicated with the operating system in some way, once again some function calls going back and forth and finally the operating system said okay here is a chunk of memory, here is a pointer to the start of that memory. right? And at that point the runtime returns to you, the malloc function succeeds, right? it gives you a non-null return value and you can proceed. Now what happens as a result is you have ownership of that particular chunk of memory and what that means is if you keep on allocating more and more memory and you do not release it, at some point in time if your program does not exit, it is quite possible that your system starts running out of memory. Once again the program, the system is likely to crash. What usually happens with most modern operating systems is if you start asking for too much memory, at some point you will encounter an out of memory error and again your program is likely to crash. In other words, the operating system tries to make sure that the system itself does not crash. It kills the program that is asking for too much memory. Okay. Now one thing that needs to be kept in mind as we discuss malloc and related terms over here is that even if I do not call the malloc function, it is quite possible that a pointer randomly points to some location that is in the heap area or in the stack area corresponding to my program just by accident or I could take the address corresponding to some location in the heap, right? I declare one variable in the heap, I find out what the address is or I take the address corresponding to a global variable, I add a little bit to it, I am reasonably confident that this is another chunk that is present in the heap. right? I can go ahead and use that. The C language does not prevent me from doing so. This is however very unsafe because at some point in time if you do call malloc, 
the program doesn't know that you have already been using this program for something else. It's sort of like going in an unreserved compartment, right? Or rather on going in a reserved compartment, but without a ticket, right? When somebody else comes along and says, this is my birth, you get evicted. Now, what happens in practice, of course, is in a C program where you are using memory that you have not explicitly asked for and got allocated, you can cause the program to crash, right? And of course, C is an interesting language. It doesn't prevent you from doing so, right? You only learn the hard way and hopefully don't do it again. Now, related to the idea of, you know, allocating memory and then not releasing it comes the question, okay, how do I release it in the first place, right? And of course, there's a function call for that. That function call is called free, right? Basically, what it says is, if I allocate a certain amount of memory, what I get back is a pointer. What the runtime does is it keeps track of all the pointers that have been allocated so far and how much memory was allocated at each point. And what that means in turn is I can then go and free a particular pointer. The runtime will look up the address corresponding to that pointer, realize that this was allocated at some point in the past and basically corresponded to let's say either 4 bytes or 20 bytes or 600 bytes of memory and say, okay, now this 600 bytes of memory is free for somebody else to use, okay? And it releases the memory. The runtime usually keeps track of all the different kinds of, different amounts of memory that are present in the system and tries to sort of, you know, manage things properly. But as a result of this, you can potentially end up in a scenario where you encounter something called fragmentation. So what's fragmentation? Let's try and understand that with a small example, right? I am showing only the allocated memory over here, right? So what exactly does this int star a malloc mean? We'll be looking at examples of that, but at a high level, what you need to understand at this point is a is a pointer to integers. And by calling the malloc function, what I have done is I have taken some chunk of memory shaded green over here, right? I've asked the system, so to say, right? This runtime libraries to allocate a chunk of memory for me. So what happens is a certain chunk of memory gets marked in the internal booking of the runtime as reserved and a pointer to that, to the start of that memory is put into this variable a. From this point onwards, a of 0 will access the first element in that memory, a of 1 will access the second integer that is byte offset 4 within that memory and so on. Fine. After some time, I go ahead and ask for another chunk of memory, call it b, of some size. I don't really care about the size either, right? And sure enough, the runtime and operating system all get together. They figure out another chunk of memory. It turns out that there is another chunk right next to a. It gives me the address corresponding to the start of that as B and now marks that area as reserved. After some time, I ask for C. Once again, the same thing, C also gives me back data. And usually, as you can imagine, right, what the operating system tries to do is it just gives you consecutive blocks of memory as far as possible, right? Why? Well, because it's the easy thing to do. But now this is where things get tricky. What if I go ahead and free the pointer b, right? What has happened is this chunk of memory corresponding to a remains where it is. This chunk of memory corresponding to c remains where it is, right? I don't automatically move it around because moving it around would actually be problematic. What ends up happening instead is this section of memory is now actually free, but my memory has now got fragmented. I have some memory out here. I have some memory down here. And somewhere in the middle, I again have a chunk of memory that is free. Now, if my next malloc request asked for exactly however much memory was over here, then that's great. You know, I can just actually assign this rather than looking down here for free memory. But what are the chances of that happening, right? I mean, we can't be sure that B is uh, the next malloc request is going to request exactly this much memory. There are two possibilities. One is that it asks for less memory, in which case I might allocate a smaller chunk of this, which actually leaves me in an even worse situation because now there is a small chunk of memory out here that is getting wasted, right? 
The other possibility is that I'm asking for something that's bigger. I can't fit it in here, so I have to go down here and look for that memory, which means that this hole in the memory remains as it is. Right? So this is called fragmentation. It's something that you cannot easily avoid. It is something to be aware of because sometimes you can end up with problems with the way that the system actually allocates memory. For the most part, the operating system tries to work around this, tries to handle this kind of fragmentation automatically. Right? It sort of figures out a different, different ways of storing chunks of free memory and if necessary it might even do something like moving a chunk of memory from one place to another right in order to defragment that is usually handled behind the scenes by the operating system it is extremely specific to the type of os that you have right so it, there's nothing that the language by itself guarantees about how you can do this all right now just a word about these two functions which I am actually not going to be talking about or even demonstrating in any detail over here. malloc is the main memory allocation function that we will be looking at. Right? There are some others as well and one of them is called calloc right? which is actually in some ways a cleaner version of malloc. What it does is that it actually just allows you to specify the number of elements that you want and it automatically computes how many bytes need to be allocated, right? Uh, as we'll see, see, malloc doesn't work that way. Malloc requires you to specify exactly how many bytes you want. So you have to do the conversion from the data type that you want to the number of bytes that you want. Calloc also does one more thing, which is that it basically initializes all the data to zero before giving it to you. Now this actually looks like a nice thing because you might have noticed in some of the previous examples that we saw or we will be seeing in some of the code that we'll uh, look at later that on occasion you can end up with basically junk values in your arrays right because they did not get initialized right. Now because of that in most cases it's usually a good idea if you can initialize the data on the other hand Think about what that means, right? Let's say that I ask for an array of size 1 billion elements, right? Which is not that big a deal today, right? You can easily think of databases that have several gigabytes of data and could actually be stored almost completely in memory, right? So an array with 1 billion elements is not beyond our imagination at this point. The problem is 1 billion elements does take quite a lot of time to go and set the values. Right? It will probably take close to a billion clock cycles, which means something like one second just to go and fill the memory with zeros. Right? For a program that needs to run fast, that might be an unnecessary overhead because it might turn out that you know out of those one billion elements, I don't actually need to explicitly use all of them. Right? Maybe I'm sort of using them in a very sparse manner or it might be that the computation that I'm performing is, is itself in the order of a few seconds. Right? And I don't really need the memory to be initialized ahead of time before using it. I can sort of initialize it when required. Right? So calloc always initializing your data may not always be desirable. Right? But it exists. It's a useful function to call in certain contexts and I'll leave it at that. There is another similar, not, not a similar function, but a related function called realloc. And as you might imagine, realloc basically allows you to change the allocation that you have requested at some point, right? So basically what you can do is you can ask for a certain amount of memory using malloc and then you can go and call the realloc function to change the amount of memory that's allocated. Why would you want to do this? There are several reasons why you might want to. The simplest idea being that, you know, the size of your array changed, right? Either it's a string and you want to have a larger string or it's an integer array or some other struct array and you want more space right, than you initially planned for. Realloc once again hits all the problems like fragmentation and so on but it handles it internally and takes care of reallocating the data as required. Right? If you are lucky all that you know the uh, memory immediately after what you have requested will be free and it can just sort of extend the allocation that is given to you. But if there is not enough memory over there, it will probably have to actually copy the data into another location and then give you a chunk that's large enough to use. 
one of the things of course that you need to keep in mind over here is the malloc function re requires you to provide the size, the number of bytes that you wanted to allocate. The problem is it doesn't keep track of that, meaning that of course the allocation keeps track of it so that free can work properly. But the compiler itself does not keep track of that, meaning that the size of the array is not known after that, right? It does not enforce limits on the index that you use to access any element in the array. And it also does not retain the size of the array as information. So the size of will actually not return the size of the array anymore. It will only return the size of a pointer from that place, which means that you as a programmer need to keep track of the sizes of all of your arrays. Right? In particular, this could potentially have an impact when we look at multidimensional arrays as we will see later. 